publications. The power of the pen as a medium of communicating uh, to others uh, goes back some 5,000 years with the invention of writing. Down through the centuries of time, the main medium of instructing and influencing the masses of people has been the written word. By far, the most powerful influence upon mankind has been and continues to be the written word of God, the Bible. With the writing of the book of Revelation by the Apostle John near the end of the first century, the pen of inspiration ended. But the pen of uninspired men has continued to influence religious history, either for good in the proclamation of divine truth or for evil in the proclamation of religious error in departing from the truth of God's word. In the early centuries of the church, the writings of the church fathers and historians inform us of the falling away that was predicted by inspiration. The Apostle Paul warned in 1 Timothy 4, uh, beginning at verse 1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul warned of the fact that there would be those that uh, would not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust would heat to themselves uh, teachers having itching ears and turn their faces away from truth, and turn, be turned unto fables. Then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the first eight verses there, uh, Paul again warned of a departure from the faith. And uh, we, uh, in studying history, we understand uh, how that that, a departure began to take place shortly after the first century. There was the development of Roman Catholicism and then its uh, domination during the Dark Ages. And then later we learn from the historical writings of men that inform us of the invention of the the printing press in the middle 1400s that helped to advance the Reformation uh, movement and the efforts of men such as John Wycliffe, uh, William Tyndall, uh, Martin Luther, and many, many others uh, who sought to put the Bible back into the hands of the common people in their own language in an effort uh, on their part to reform Catholicism. But we know that such efforts didn't go far enough and it only resulted in the divisions of Protestantism and continued departure from the pattern that is revealed in God's word. So our study will be confined to the Restoration Movement in the 17 and 1800s 
and the numerous publications that um, had such a powerful influence in calling men back to the Bible and promoting the principles of restoring New Testament Christianity. It was also through these publications that the Restoration leaders uh, discussed and debated the major issues affecting the church, such as missionary societies, the use of instrumental music and worship, and uh, many other issues. Our study will seek to highlight some of the most powerful publications and their editors and the influence that they had on the major issues of their day. In an 1852 edition of the Millennial Harbinger, Alexander Campbell wrote, The tongue of the eloquent orator and the pen of the ready writer are the most potential instrumentalities of moral good or moral evil in the world. And how true that was then and how true it is even today. One of the earliest publications that we know of was the Herald of Gospel Liberty that was published from 1808 to 1817. Its editor was Elias Smith, one of the early uh, individuals involved in restoration. The first issue was published from Smith's home in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, on September the 1st, 1808. It had 274 subscribers. And according to Smith, this was the first religious paper ever to be published in the world, he stated. But it was published every other Thursday it consisted of four pages. Those pages were nine by 11 inches in size. And the cost of a subscription for a year to that paper was $1. By February the 4th, 1814, the subscription list had reached 1,500. The motto, printed across the top of the first issue of the Herald of Gospel Liberty was from realms far distant and from chimes unknown, we make the knowledge of our King your own. Elias Smith and Abner Jones were leaders in restoration among the Baptists in Vermont and also in New Hampshire. But Smith himself struggled between Calvinism and Universalism. In 1801, he had, he had gone into Universalism. But by the spring of 1802, he had rejected Calvinism and uni uh, Universalism and had concluded that the name Christian was enough for all followers of Christ. Without addition, of the words Baptist or Methodist or any other name. He spoke also against the catechism as being an invention of men. But because of financial woes, uh, Smith ceased publication of the Herald of Gospel Liberty in October 1817. And at that time, he had uh, gone back into universalism. 
So while in the early beginnings of restoration, the herald of gospel liberty served its purpose of pointing men at least toward the New Testament. It was succeeded by a paper called the Christian Herald in 1818. And then uh, uh, in 1835 by a paper called the Christian Journal. But two of the most influential uh, publications in the early restoration movement were the Christian Baptist and the Millennial Harbinger. Both these uh, papers were edited and published by Alexander Campbell. The Christian Baptist was uh, published from 1823 to 1830. And then the, the, the Millennial Harbinger from 1830 uh, to 1870, even beyond Campbell's death. But Campbell had learned from his published debate with Walker the, the power of the press to promote the principles of the Restoration Movement. He considered himself to be an impartial advocate of truth. Campbell had intended to name uh, the paper simply The Christian. But Walter Scott suggested to him the name the Christian Baptist as a means of disarming prejudice among the Baptists. But in reality, the strong tone of the paper in exposing error actually increased the opposition of the Baptist. Campbell, in expressing his aim of uh, the Christian Baptist, he wrote, The Christian Baptist shall espouse the cause of no religious sect, excepting that sect called Christians at Antioch. Its sole object shall be the eviction of truth and the exposure of exposure of error in doctrine and practice. During the years of 1825 through 1829, Campbell wrote a series of some 32 articles entitled The Ancient Order of Things, in which he dealt with primitive Christianity. And in these articles, he measured the practices of uh, Protestantism by the New Testament pattern. Campbell considered the clergy, the creeds of men, and human organizations to be the three idols of Protestantism. And he sought to overthrow them in the Christian Baptist. After seven years of publication of that paper, Campbell decided to drop the name Christian uh, Baptist over concerns that it might be labeled as a party. And he also decided that he needed to change the tone of his writings to more moderate. Uh, as friends had suggested to him. So he uh, began the Millennial Harbinger in 1830. And in this new publication, which almost doubled in size to uh, 48 pages, Campbell took a milder tone, but he continued to expose error and to promote the principles of restoration, calling men back to the Bible. In 1831, he wrote, But brethren, while we proclaim the ancient gospel, let us do it in the spirit of that gospel. Let our object 
be to turn sinners to God. Gravity, sincerity, mildness, and benevolence must be the attributes of every successful proclaimer of the word. Very wise words. Then concerning the name Millennial Harbinger, Campbell believed that there would be a period of time when the nations of the world would be in submission to the kingdom of Christ. That in time, Christianity would be victorious in the world. And so in the prospectus of the millennial harbinger, he wrote, this work shall be devoted to the destruction of sectarianism, infidelity, and anti-Christian doctrine and practice. It shall have for its object the development and introduction of that political and religious order of society called the millennium, which will be the consummation of that ultimate society proposed in the Christian scripture. He believed that the kingdom of God on earth could be realized in his fullness only after a unification of the children of God. In 1846, Campbell's son-in-law, W.K. Pendleton, was added to the editorial staff. And the Harbinger was increased to 60 pages. In January of 1865, about a year before Campbell's death, in March of 1866, Pendleton became the editor, and he served as the editor of that paper from 1865 to 1870. But the tremendous influence that Campbell exerted on the Restoration Movement through the Christian Baptists and then the Millennial Harbinger as well as the some 60 books that he published. His influence is beyond measure. But his views were not always on, on the side of truth. While the early years of the 19th century were a time of unity and tremendous growth of the Restoration Movement, Seeds were being planted that would result in the controversies, the departures and divisions that would take place by the end of the century, all of which are recorded in the various publications that existed at that time. In the Millennial Harbinger in 1831 and 32, Campbell published a series of articles on the cooperation of churches. Near Campbell's home in Virginia in 1834, 13 churches agreed to employ two evangelists. They appointed a treasurer to receive funds from all the churches, those 13 churches, for the support of these two evangelists. They set up a committee of 13 to supervise the evangelist and their work. And soon after that, there were statewide uh, cooperation meetings. Uh, that were being held in various states. Campbell proposed a general organization among the churches to which Walter Scott, his friend, strongly opposed, stating who made Brother Campbell an organizer over us. 
The first brotherhood organization was the American Christian Bible Society in 1845. It was led by D.S. Burnett. And oddly, Campbell was opposed to it. But in 1849, when the American Christian Missionary Society was established, even though Campbell was not present when it was established and organized, he was elected its first president. And he would serve in that office the rest of his life from 1849 to 1866. He also withdrew his objections to the Bible Society since uh, it now has been endorsed by a brotherhood convention. But in back in 1823, when Campbell began publishing the Christian Baptist, he had denounced missionary society. Jacob Kreef, Jr. was the most outspoken early critic of the society. And he reminded Campbell of his earlier views. He said, if you were right in the Christian Baptist, you are wrong now. If you are right now, you were wrong then. Pretty simple logic. But Campbell was opposed to the use of instrumental music in worship. He stated that to all spiritually minded Christians, such aids would be as a cowbell in a concert. But his son-in-law, W.K. Pendleton, uh, editor of the Millennial Harbinger after Campbell's death, he believed that the instrument was a question of mere expediency, although he conceded that it was not used during the early centuries of the Christian era. But then in 1826, there began uh, another paper called the Christian Messenger. It was published, edited by Barton W. Stone from 1826 to 1845. Stone began publishing uh, his paper in November of 1826 near Georgetown, Kentucky. The Messenger was published monthly. It consisted of 24 pages, served as a unifying force. In fact, its motto was, let the unity of Christians be our polar star. And concerning unity, Stone wrote, we who have taken the word of God alone for our rule of faith and practice are the only people that dare speak out fearlessly. We have no name to lose. Already it is cast out as evil. We have no salaries at stake. This might be a temptation to be silent. We have no fear of offending our brethren and fellow sufferers for the kingdom of Christ while we walk in the truth and keep within the Bible. John T. Johnson served as co-editor of the messenger from 1832 to 1834 when Stone had moved uh, to Jacksonville, Illinois. But the Christian Messenger ceased publication in 1844, shortly after Stone's death. But through the Messenger, Stone opposed the efforts of those who were trying to organize the congregations into a denominational pattern. He wrote on a whole variety of biblical subjects, constantly stressing the great need for unity in the realm of religion. Walter Scott published a paper from 1832 to 1842 called simply The Evangelist. 
Scott's analytical and exhaustive treatment of the scriptures led him to great truths relative to the church of Jesus Christ, including God's simple plan of salvation. Faith in Christ, repentance from sin, confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and baptism for the remission of sins. He was called the Golden Oracle because of his uh, preaching ability. But one of the most influential publications, especially in the northern states, was the American Christian Review that was published from 1856 to 1878 by Benjamin Franklin. Franklin, uh, his editorial work actually began in 1845 when he began a paper called The Reformer, which he published monthly in uh, November of 1846. He enlarged uh, that paper to 64 pages, and then uh, from 1846 to 1856, uh, he published a number of other papers. But Franklin's greatest influence as an editor was exerted through the American Christian Review, which he founded in 1856 and continued through the remainder of his life. For the first two years of the review, it was published monthly. But in January 1858, it became a weekly publication. The review was one of the most conservative in its approach uh, to New Testament Christianity. Franklin's stand on various issues through the review emphasizes uh, his uh, conservative approach to the scripture. Prior to the Civil War, he supported the American Christian Missionary Society that was established in 1849. And for a short period of time, he even served as the corresponding secretary. But by 1866, he had turned against the society as an unscriptural organization. He was opposed to the society supporting the Union during the war. He felt that it was getting out of its area of religious influence. He was opposed to Christians participating in that war. He was strongly opposed to the use of instrumental music in the worship regarding the instrument as an innovation and he refused to preach anywhere where the instrument was used. The review was a strong conservative influence in the North, opposing the innovations that liberalism was seeking to introduce. In 1886, Daniel Sommer bought the American Christian Review and changed its name to Octographic Review and later to Apostolic Review. As early as 1871, Sommer had begun writing articles for the review. But he was a man who had strong convictions. And at times, he was accused of being an extremist and a self-appointed watchdog over the Brotherhood. He was strongly opposed to instrumental music and worship and other innovations. He was sensitive to apostasies and there's really no way of knowing how many congregations he prevented from being swept into digression. But there was a paper that was established uh, called The Christian Standard by, edited by Isaac Errett. There was a group of influential brethren in the North, including the wealthy 
Phillips Brothers of Pennsylvania, Isaac Eric, James A. Garfield, W.K. Pendleton, and others who determined to launch a weekly journal called the Christian Standard to counteract the conservative influence of Franklin's American Christian Review. Isaac Eric was appointed editor-in-chief. The liberal views of Isaac Eret expressed in the pages of the Christian Standard uh, did much to lead many away from the truth. Eret was a strong supporter of the missionary societies. He promoted them through the Standard. He had no objection to instrumental music in the worship, but considered it an unnecessary expedient. In fact, he was the first preacher of the movement to accept and wear the title reverend to the dismay of conservative brethren. Eret advocated a progressive religion. But one of the most influential papers in the South at that time was the Gospel Advocate that began to be published in 1855, edited by Talbert Fanning. In July 1855, Fanning began publishing uh, the Gospel Advocate in Nashville, Tennessee, which would become the most influential journal in the South. He was assisted by William Lipscomb, uh, the brother of David Lipscomb, who would later become editor of this paper. But in the early 1850s, Fanning had supported the American Missionary Society. But by 1855, he had come to question and doubt the wisdom and scripturalness of human organizations and cooperation and had hoped that the advocate might be used for a free discussion of the subject of human organizations. In February 1857, he wrote, we regard the Church of Christ as the only divinely authorized Bible, missionary, and temperance society on earth. And furthermore, we believe that it is in and by means of the church, the world is to be converted. Christians are to labor for the Lord in all the efforts to do the service of the Lord through human institutions. It has seemed to us that the church is degraded and rendered indeed useless. It became necessary to suspend publication of the Gospel Advocate during the years of the Civil War, 1861 through 1865. Then in 1866, there was a rebirth of the Gospel Advocate as a weekly publication. Talbert Fanning and David Lipscomb were listed as editors at that time. But it seems that Fanning was too busy with other activities to devote much time to the paper. So by 1868, David Lipscomb was the sole editor and would shoulder the editorial responsibilities for some 50 years to come. He would be assisted by co-editors, E.G. Sewell, and F. D. Srigley. The war had ended, but it had left a nation in shambles, in destruction, in ruin, the like of which no section of the nation had ever experienced, and especially was it felt in the South. Inflation, hunger, hatred had swept over the country like a cloud of gloom. There was increased conflict in the restoration movement over the missionary society and over instrumental music and other issues. 
as the condition of the country in those first years following uh, closely the Civil War was reflected in the church. David Liska looked upon the war as divine punishment for evil in the nation. And he warned, shall we in beginning life anew again pursue the same course that brought us to so disastrous an end? No man would have more influence and do more to stabilize the church in the South during those critical years ahead than David Lipscomb through the pages of the Gospel Advocate. He wrote that the fact that we had not a single paper known to us that Southern people could read without having their feelings wounded by political insinuations and slurs had more to do with calling the advocate into existence than all other circumstances combined. Although neither Lipscomb nor Fanning intended to make the advocate a paper just for the South, it was perceived as such by many brethren in the law in the North, and therefore its influence in the North was limited. As a result, churches in the South, for the most part, remain faithful to early restoration principles, whereas in the North, where the advocate was little read and where Eric's Christian standard was more extensively read, the majority of the churches went with the liberal movement, accepting many innovations. But the gospel advocate was a strong conservative influence on the church. There are many other uh, publications that we could study and, and talk about. We've dealt really with only a few of them, but we believe that these are among the most powerful and influential writings of the Restoration leaders. These writings represent the knowledge, the scholarship, the strong faith, of these editors as they sought to lead men back to the Bible. We're able to see the power of the pen for good and right, as well as for wrong and religious error. We cannot imagine the same level of success in restoring New Testament Christianity without the benefit of these publications that demonstrated respect for the authority of the Bible. So as we learn and benefit from the publications of the past, we're reminded of the importance of sound publications, of journals, of books, of tracts, and such will always be needed. Materials written by faithful men who respect the authority of the Word of God, such is essential in our view in keeping the church on the straight and narrow path.